Okay, welcome back everybody. Uh, this is Professor Obeno for another lecture on contaminant transport in groundwater. This is our uh, fourth lecture on contaminant transport. Okay, so so far we've seen uh, the first lecture we reviewed the problem of contaminant transport in porous media and then derived the advection dispersion equation, so the differential equation for the basic transport processes of advection and dispersion. The second lecture we looked at solutions for uh, particular um, initial and boundary conditions, so analytical solutions. Uh, then we also looked at, reviewed the numerical solutions for more complicated domains like the one illustrated here from GMS, from Aquavio. Uh, and then uh, the last lecture, the third lecture, was dedicated to sorption. So we started to look at uh, reactive transport, so contaminant plumes really, and what can happen uh, in plumes. So the first case was the sorption. And again, this is a heterogeneous reaction, meaning this is the interaction between the solid and the liquid phase. Now for today, we are moving on to homogeneous reactions. And these are the reactions that uh, take place entirely in the liquid phase, essentially. So there's no influence of the solid uh, matrix. It's all a liquid, liquid uh, problem. Uh, we will dedicate two lectures to these types of reactions. Today we will um, review some basic chemistry for those of you who maybe didn't have much of it uh, during undergrad. So we'll review the concepts of equilibrium uh, reactions and kinetics. Uh, and then in the next lecture on homogeneous reactions, so this is part one here uh, of the homogeneous reactions. Uh, and then in the next lecture, we will uh, look at uh, biodegradation, so essentially monokinetics, so different type of kinetics, uh, and also the problem of uh, particle um, tra uh, transport, so colloids and filtration theory. So this is the next lecture. So again, a quick review of our last lecture. So last time, again, we studied the retardation uh, of solutes during transport due to sorption. Uh, and we've looked at linear and nonlinear sorption. So remember that for linear sorption, the, the retardation factor uh, is a constant, basically doesn't depend on concentration. Whereas for nonlinear sorption, which is the uh, more common sorption, basically, uh, the retardation factor is basically a function of concentration itself. So there's some nonlinearities uh, that have to be accounted for. Uh, on the right hand side here, you can see the effect of retardation on uh, three different compounds. So chloride is a conservative tracer. So this is basically moving, you know, with the water here, this first um, uh, breakthrough curve. And you can see here uh, that it comes early, this is time, so let's say 80 days here, and you can see that retarded species, so here we have carbon tetrachloride and tetrachloroethylene, uh, and they're coming later, right? So there's some retardation for this first one, and again, notice the tailing, that's more tailing, you know, with the retardation, so nonlinear retardation, and then finally the uh, tetrachloroethylene has an even higher retardation and probably some nonlinearity as well because you can see that tailing again uh, happening. Okay, uh, so finally the intro for the homogeneous reactions. Uh, again, I already mentioned that homogeneous reactions take place in the liquid, so it's a liquid-liquid um, uh, phase, right? Uh, so there's no solid interaction. Uh, now for today we'll look at equilibrium uh, reactions, so equilibrium theory. Uh, so again, if the reactions are reversible, so you have an example here down here, right? The simplest chemical reaction possible, A plus B uh, gives C, right? And there can be a forward and a backwards reaction. So it proceeds at some rate K1, and then C, you know, this associates into A and B at some rates K2. Uh, and here on the, in the middle, you can see an illustration and what happens, right? So let's say you put those A and B uh, together in um, in a beaker, right? Early on, right, there is some forward reaction, A plus B goes to C, uh, and some backwards reaction, so HI dissociates into H2 and I2, uh, 
right? And then at some point, the uh, species are at equilibrium. So when equilibrium is reached, right, the rate of the reaction is a constant, and we'll see in a minute what that is, but this is the equilibrium is reached. Um, now, if the reaction doesn't reach equilibrium, or it is non-reversible, right? So if you have, for example, precipitation, last time we saw uh, some sorption problem, right? That was basically like this, and then you had the reversible reaction when it dissociates from the surface and goes back into the solution. Now imagine you have a system where you have a sorbate, you know, uh, precipitating, or two species, you know, associating and precipitating, then this reaction is irreversible. The precipitate is out of solution, right? And now there's no uh, equilibrium at all. It just goes away. Uh, so again, if it doesn't reach an equilibrium or it's a non-reversible reaction like this one, it proceeds only one way, then, you know, it's a uh, homogeneous non-equilibrium reaction. So again, we'll review equilibrium first and then we'll get into the kinetics and look at those uh, reaction rates. Uh, here is just an illustration of an algae farm for bioflume just to illustrate that we're talking about the liquid uh, phase here. So the same um, chemical reaction here at the top, A plus B goes to C. So if the uh, reaction proceeds at some rate K1 to the right and K2 to the left, right? Uh, if either K1 or K2 is zero, that's basically what I described, the reaction is irreversible. Otherwise, there is an equilibrium constant, right? At some point, it reaches some equilibrium. Uh, and you can see that the uh, equilibrium constant, K equilibrium here, equals the, the uh, ratio of the K1 and K2, of the you know, rate to the right, rate to the left. And this is equals, in turn, to uh, the products over the reactants, right? So C is the product divided by the product of the reactants A times B, right? So here there's only C. Obviously, if it was C plus D, then it would be, you know, C times D here divided by A times B, okay? Uh, so this is the equilibrium constant and basically defines, um, or it is dictated by the amount of products at equilibrium or the amount of uh, chemical compounds involved in the reaction at equilibrium. How much of the products and how much versus how much of the reactants uh, you know, uh, cohabitate in the solution together at equilibrium. Um, now again, if the reaction is fast uh, relative to transport rates, and this is really important, we'll see how this ties into transport in a minute. But if the reactions are very fast compared to the transport, then you, know, you may not achieve an equilibrium, even though you know, in theory, if you were in a beaker, there was no transport, you might have equilibrium. Um, in environmental systems as well, you know, th usually they're open systems, so again, there is transport and there is also fluxes uh, at boundaries, right? So if you have um, one of the A's or B's, for example, that is pumped into your um, control volume, so let's say, you know, into your aquifer, there is replenishment of nitrate because of agriculture, you know, continuously. Uh, then nitrate is basically never at equilibrium with anything else because it's just pumped into it, right? So uh, again, the concentrations or the amount, the mass uh, fluxes at the boundary can dictate, you know, systems that are away from equilibrium. So for photosynthesis, for example, uses the energy right from sunlight, obviously, to artificially maintain non-equilibrium concentration, right, of reduced species, so mostly like carbon as sugars, right, nitrogen as protein. So we use the energy from the sunlight to basically uh, reduce carbon dioxide, right, and make uh, sugars from it. Okay, so now I'm using the same equation as before, but I'm adding the stoichiometric coefficient into it, right? So in the previous slide, I had A plus B goes to C, so everything was 1, 1, 1, so that made the equation uh, easier a little bit. Now here you can see that my equilibrium constant, right, you have to raise the concentrations to the power of the stoichiometric constant, right, so things are different. And again, I, I'm uh, putting that same cartoon here, uh, showing uh, the iodine and the hydrogen here uh, reacting together, and you can see that you get two molecules of HI for one and one of the hydrogen and the iodide. Um, so again, you have to include those stoichiometric coefficients basically in your equilibrium uh, constant. 
uh, again to the right is the same illustration as to the left here on the top right so that shows the rate versus time uh, but at the bottom here you can see the evolution of the actual molecules right so the reactants obviously are consumed and then the products appear right if you start again uh, with the zero and you know some some reactants and no products at the beginning just like at the left side now the products show up the reactants are consumed and then at equilibrium right there is an equal rates left and right but uh, the the reactants and products amounts may be a little different right so I have another illustration here okay so you can see how those a goes to B over time right and now I'm getting into the uh, kinetics right so there is a rate that a change to B and that rate is the change in concentration over the time taken right so this is the uh, if you will the velocity of the reaction right is the change in concentration divided by the time it took right so if you start with all A's at time zero that's exactly like we had before right we started with only the reactants and then over some time B shows up and after some time, right, well, here it's all Bs, but you can imagine if there was some equilibrium, right? So over time, there's more and more B, right, um, that show up until you reach that equilibrium, if you ever reach the equilibrium. Now, again, the rate of that reaction is the change in concentration divided by the time. That's very simple, right? It's like mass per volume per time, right? So how much concentration changes in that uh, beaker, in that uh, volume? Again, here, just the difference equation for this, right? So the concentration at time two minus the concentration at time one divided by time two minus time one, difference in time. And then again, in differential form, right? This is just dA minus, so the reaction rate is minus dA dt, right? Equals plus dB dt, if I can get my t here, right? Well, that's cropped a little bit, sorry. Uh, but you can see how the products, right, is positive. So we have a positive change in B, negative change in A. Uh, and this is really how kinetics work, right? So we're trying to get to that, you know, rate uh, of the reaction. Okay, so another illustration of the kinetics is given here. Um, and now we're going to plot, right, concentration over time. And there's several possible... Uh, ways that concentration changes over time, right? So the first one is the more uh, obvious one, right? And it's the linear, um, the linear uh, change, right? So if concentration decreases, you know, constantly over time, right? So if there's a constant change of concentration over time, uh, then the change in concentration doesn't depend on concentration, basically, right? Um, so again, the concentration here you can see over time just decreases linearly, meaning K doesn't depend on concentration, it just depends, you know, or the concentration itself, right, just changes linearly with time. So it's a very simple process. Now, it doesn't have to be this way, right? Let's say, uh, let's say you have something like this, right? You look at your concentration in your beaker over time, right? If you fit this, now it's not linear, it's like an exponential sort of a, uh, sort of an equation, right? So concentration doesn't have to uh, decrease linearly with time. So in other words, if we think of what that means, right? Um, that means that the rate of reaction changes over time, right? So at early times when concentration is high, right? There is a lot of change, right? The rate of change is, is fast, right? So again, right here, if I can maybe use this right here, right, the rate of change here is high, whereas here, right, towards the end when the concentration is small, the rate of change is small, right? So there's a change in the rate at which uh, the concentration decreases depending on the concentration. So this is a nonlinear uh, change. Okay, so again, uh, in this case, obviously, this, since this is an exponential decay, right, if we log the y-axis, right, now we're transforming that data into a linear data, right, uh, semi-log y, right, so if we log on the, the y, the exponential becomes a straight line, and now the slope of that line, right, is the rate constant for the exponential decay. Uh, and again, we've talked about exponentials several times in this course, right, so then, then now the log of the concentration, right, decreases 
uh, linearly with time, but it's the log of the concentration, not the concentration itself. All right, so now getting into the um, dirty details. Um, so again, up top here, the same uh, equation we had before, right? So A plus B goes to C, and you can see I included the stoichiometric coefficients, a, little a, b, c's. Uh, and now the rate of the reaction, again, remember, is dA, dt, right? So minus dA, dt is the uh, rate of the reaction per, or the rate of uh, the reaction for A, for the species A, equals uh, kappa here, or k, a to the p, b to the q. So now notice that the rate of the reaction for A depends on both A and B, right? Both the uh, species of reactants. So, th because the change of on of A, right, will be proportional to the change in B if there's two species. So again, the rate of change of A is some kind of a constant times the two react the two reactant concentrations raised to some power. Okay. Now, one thing that's really important here is that uh, A or P and Q, excuse me, P and Q here are not the stoichiometric coefficients, right? So here you would need data basically to uh, solve for uh, P and Q. So again, if you had the data that I just showed you, concentration over time, now you could actually know what dA dt is, you know, some number. Again, it doesn't have to be constant, uh, you know, across time. So here's it would change over time, right? dA dt would be different here than here. For the same dt, right, we have a different change in dA. So we'd get a number here, a number there, uh, and then we can compare that to the concentration and solve for the exponent. So the point is, p and q are not the stoichiometric uh, factors. They are, you know, solutions to those equations here or the plot. So you need some experimental data to be able to uh, calculate what uh, p and q uh, are. Now, K is the reaction rate constant for the species, right? So little k or kappa or k, here is the, react the reaction rate constant for species A. K prime is the reaction rate constant for species B. And again, in this case, you know, that would be the same because again, A and B disappear or appear at the same rate. Uh, and then for C, of course, it's the third one. So each, um, each species that has its own uh, reaction rate constant. Now the order of the reaction, right, uh, with respect to um, a given species uh, is the order, so the reaction order little p, q, and r is the order with respect to that species, and I'll talk about reaction order in a second. So there can be zeroth order, uh, so for a zeroth order, that's basically when concentration decreases linearly with time, right? And then little k here is constant, so there is no dependence on the rate of change to time, right? If there's no dependence, excuse me, there's no dependence of k on time, right? So k is a constant, so then that would be a zeroth order um, reaction because the, um, the you know, the change in concentration does not depend on concentration, right? So, so basically that would be dc dt, right, is k, is a constant, right? So, or you can think of it as kc to the zero, right? So this is one, right? So it's a constant, right? So dc dt is constant, meaning that's a zeroth order uh, of reaction. Again, c to the zero, right? c to the zero, zeroth order, right? Now, if dc dt equals k, uh, kc, for example, right, to the one, right, now we have a first order reaction for c, okay, so on and so forth. So the order of the reaction, right, p, q, and r give you the order of the reaction um, for that specific uh, molecule. Okay, so same demonstration here, right? So if Q equals zero, right? Again, this is the same as before. Minus dA dt goes to, you know, call it one, K1, A to the P, B to the Q, right? Now, if Q equals zero, that's the demonstration I just said, right? If this is zero, this whole thing is one, right? And now this is equals to K1, A to the P, 
Okay, so it doesn't depend on B, it just depends on A. Now if P equals one, right? Now this same equation reduces to K1 A to the one, right? So A, that's it, A to the one, okay? So now if we have this equation here, we can actually solve this, right? So it's the same as having an expression for, you know, if we go back to C as concentration of something, it can be this C or it can be another C, it doesn't matter. DC DT equals minus KC, right? You can see here, uh, DA DT equals minus KA, right? So same equation. Now this equation here, we've seen a bunch of times, this is just your, um, first order reaction so remember i said you know the reaction order you know for a is you know whatever that pqr thing is so it's one in this case right so for a first order reaction we get this simple um differential equation right that we can solve easily right so we can do one over c dc we just separate the variables right equals minus k dt right and then we can just integrate those both sides. So here you can see K is a constant. So integral of DT is T, right? And then one over C is going to give you L and C, right? So when we integrate uh, these two things, you know, we, we're going to get that the natural log of C is proportional to time. So there's a K here and then uh, minus KT, right? And remember, this is exactly what we've seen before with the little example where, you know, if this is an exponential, so again, what we can do here is exponentiate both sides. So you end up with C of T equals E to the minus K T, right? T, C of T here. And this is the same as we've done before. And this is your exponential decay over time. So we're going back to the same thing. So now again, the change of the change in concentration changes, you know, with time, but you know, it changes predictably. And this is again, the, the rate of the exponential. So again, a simple, very simple solution uh, to the first order uh, reaction. Yeah. Okay, so one example of a true first order reaction in nature is radioactive decay. Uh, and I've mentioned already, you know, the sites down in Oak Ridge, that's a national lab where uh, the original experiment, you know, Manhattan Project and original experiments on nuclear uh, engineering, I guess you could call it, were made. And so there's a lot of, you know, uh, uh, waste, uh, uh, radioactive waste down there that um, infiltrated groundwater uh, around the site. Uh, and so, you know, again, radioactive decay is really important. So here on the left is an illustration. Again, you can recognize the exponential decay characteristic of uh, first order uh, reactions. Uh, but here we frame it in, in that half-life uh, aspect of radioactive, right? So if you start at 1000 as your initial uh, concentration, you know, after some time, obviously you divide it by two. Right, so when you get to 500, there's a time corresponding, right, which is the half-life. And then when you divide this by two again, right, this is going to happen at another half-life, right, two t and a half, three t and a half, so on and so forth. So you can see how the exponential curve works, basically, right. Uh, so now, you know, if we compare this to what we had before, remember the equation for this is, or here is like n number of nucleides, but it's the same thing. Is your uh, Original concentration minus KT, we've said, right? Now, notice that K here has units of per time. It's a rate, right? It's the exponential rate, which means that 1 over K has units of time, right? So there's a characteristic time that is 1 over K, 1 over the rate. Again, this is, you know, review of what we've done before with exponential um, uh, fitting. Now, the relationship between the half-life and K is actually, so again, lambda, the half-life, is a time as well, right? But it's a different time. So there's a, a correction factor, if you will, that is that natural log of 2, which is about, you know, 0.7-ish, right? So lambda equals roughly 0.7 times the characteristic time. So let's call this, you know, time, right? So it's about, so... The half-life, the time it takes to divide by two is about 0.7, you know, the rate of the exponential. Now, one thing that's really useful, so if you look at, 
anything that has an exponential you know decay or even an exponential growth unfortunately like we're experiencing right now right you can use your matlab and your easy easy fit toolbox fit an exponential to this right and this is going to tell you this is growing at exponential kt right and this is going to tell you what k is now 1 over k is going to give you a time and if you multiply that by 0 0.7 that gives you the doubling time right so again for something that grows it's a doubling time for something that decays it's a half-life is the same concept right and again this half-life or doubling time is just 0 0.7 of that characteristic time okay which is about you know for the covid it's about three days you know unabated and then you can go a little slower uh, you know with intervention Okay, so how do, you, how do all these um, chemical discussion um, fit into our transport equation, right? So let's go back to our basic transport equation from last time. So we have a retardation factor, again, linear on that. We have our change in concentration over time equals some dispersion process, some advective process. And now we add this new uh, term here for first order reaction. Again, this is only true for first order reaction, right? So remember dc dt equals minus kc, right, is your first order assumption. So if we assume there's a first order reaction for, for example, for decay, then we can write the whole equation, right? We add the transport, basically, which is the dispersion and advection. So now we have dispersion, advection, decay, and retardation, right? And this is our whole equation. Now the solution of this is, well, we already done that, right? So we know that c of x and t is a Gaussian m over square root of 4 pi dt well m over a if you want depending on you know how you want to do this but minus x minus ut squared divided by 4 dt and now right remember this solution here right so now we have another exponential minus kt and that's it this is your whole solution again I, I assume r is one here right there's no retardation in this solution if there is retardation again remember that all you do is rescale dnu right by r and then the reactive so you can see if you shift r to the right hand side now you have d over r u over r and just like we did last time, right, K over R, right? So it looks like the reaction rate is also uh, diminished. Again, remember that homogeneous reactions all happen in the liquid phase, right? So if you have absorbing solute that is also decaying in the bulk, you know, when it is stuck to a rock, to, to a grain, obviously it's not participating in the homogeneous reaction. So that's why you're rescaling also, you know, your um, reaction rate here. Okay, and now we have the whole equation, and again, simply this is the same as last time. If we look at what that does, you know, to actual breakthrough curves uh, that move around. Uh, so now we don't, again, if R is 1, right? So now I'm back to R is 1, so there's no retardation. So the plume moves at the same speed because there's no retardation. But now we're, you know, decaying, so we're literally removing mass, right? And again, this difference between the blue and the red, uh, the blue and the green, excuse me, this is the missing mass. Remember that mass is, you know, just the integral of cx dx, right, in space. So this is x. So, you know, the, the area under the, or the area between the blue and the green curve is the mass removed. Okay, the mass removed is just the difference between those two curves. And again, this is, you know, the, dif the difference between those two things is just this term here. Okay, so again, first order decay, very uh, useful. Okay, just to conclude here, uh, next time we'll see that biodegradation, so uh, biologically mediated uh, reactions can be considered first order uh, often, right? So not systematically, but sometimes we can just, sometimes it appears that the reaction doesn't depend on the concentration of one of the reactants. So again, if you think back to your A plus B goes to C, right? I already mentioned that in the intro, but if say B is very high compared to A, right? So it will appear that basically the reaction doesn't really depend on the 
uh, concentration will be because there's so much of it, right, that it's not limiting, right? So it's not a limiting factor. There's a ton of it around in the environment. So even if we consume some during this reaction, right, the bulk concentration of B didn't change much because, you know, there's so much of it. So if that's the case, then the reaction basically proceeds as a first order reaction, right? So again, uh, A to the one, B to the zero, right? So if it doesn't depend on B, then we back to a first order reaction. So a lot of environmental reactions, we can actually model or uh, uh, simulate as a first order. So we we'll talk a, a bit about this at the top of the next lecture. Uh, and then we'll go into the monokinetics and when there is saturation, when things actually do depend, when the rate does depend on, you know, both uh, reactants, then what happens. Um, and then finally, we'll talk about colloids as well. So when you have like, you know, when you're interested in pathogens, for example, or particles, you know, even sediment, uh, fine sediment transport within, you know, the groundwater, um, you know, during construction, for example, you know, you have to have permits from the EPA to release uh, solids, to release sediment. Uh, and so how does that work basically so that's what we'll do uh, next time all right thank you